thank you uh, very much. I'm uh, Basil Shex. I uh, work at uh, INSERM. I'm an INSERM uh, research director. Um, I uh, work uh, also, I, I, I'm also affiliated with the Sorbonne Université uh, in Paris. Uh, I'm part of the Pierre Louis Institute of uh, Epidemiology and Public Health. Uh, I uh, lead in this institute, which is a uh, uh, UMR. Uh, uh, 1136. Uh, I lead a, a small team called uh, the Nemesis team, um, which is uh, specialized in those types of uh, sensor and smartphone-based uh, investigation of uh, environmental effects on health. Um, so, um, well, uh, the objective of this uh, talk uh, today is to provide uh, um, a panorama of the use uh, that is made of these uh, wearable uh, sensors and smartphones in environment uh, and health research. And the aim, uh, well, is to um, reflect together also on the strengths, uh, limitations, and perspectives of this type of approaches. So uh, I need to specify that uh, when uh, referring to uh, uh, wearable uh, sensors, um, uh, we refer to devices that can be easily carried by the participants uh, that are connected or not to the network. So uh, these uh, wearable sensors are not necessarily uh, connected devices. They can be, they, can't, they, they can be uh, uh, unconnected. And uh, uh, they are tools that collect uh, information passively uh, uh, which means uh, without the uh, intervention of uh, the uh, subject. So um, here we aim to discuss about the research uh, on environmental effects. So quite obviously, at least uh, for me, uh, um, I will uh, start by discussing the use that is made of uh, GPS receivers. So you know these tools that track the location of, of people uh, over time. And um, well, over uh, three successive slides, I will uh, provide examples of studies that have used uh, GPS receivers for different uh, purposes. So in this first study, uh, well, uh, the objective was to better use GPS receivers to better define what is uh, the, the neighborhood of life, the, 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 the neighborhood of residence of uh, American adolescents, uh, while in this uh, literature, most often uh, studies have used uh, administrative areas to uh, define the, the, particip the, 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 the residential neighborhoods of participants. And so uh, 32 U.S. adolescents carried a GPS a receiver and an accelerometer. And here, the GPS points that were collected, these adolescents in green, the GPS points in green, were used to uh, compare uh, the, the, the neighborhood of residence that was self-reported by the participants, which is in blue. So the participants uh, drew on the map their own neighborhood and compare it to the administrative neighborhood, which is also which is reported here in uh, in red. So uh, and, and and so well, it, it was found that um, adolescents. Uh, spend more time in their self-reported neighborhood, in the neighborhood that they provided by themselves, than in the administrative neighborhood. And it was the case after um, it was controlled on the size, uh, we, uh, after they controlled, uh, the, 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 the researchers controlled for the size of the, of the two neighborhoods, of course. And also it was found that these, uh, uh, these participants, these adolescents, practiced uh, more physical activity in their self-reported neighborhood than in the administrative neighborhood. And again, this was the case after uh, controlling for the size of this, uh, of this uh, neighborhood. So here, the, the, the GPS receiver was used to validate the definition of the neighborhood of participants, uh, demonstrating that a self-reported neighborhood was uh, more uh, efficient. Uh, well, of course, uh, a second use, like the, the most, uh, the main interest of GPS receivers uh, in environment health research is to uh, capture the exposure of participants to environmental uh, risk factors. And not only at their residence, but like at the level of their uh, trips, 
and uh, visited places. Uh, and so in this study that I'm uh, reporting here, uh, well, it's not our studies. I want also to rely on, on uh, studies from the literature. So in this uh, uh, study, the aim was to, um, was to capture the exposure of uh, children to uh, what is called the food environment, which is the type of uh, food outlets to which the, the, these children were exposed. And the point uh, in this uh, work is that, um, well, uh, during motorized travels, uh, contact with the environment are uh, reduced. It's not the same when you are driving a car than when, when, when you are walking. So uh, the, the aim, the objective was to determine the so-called uh, non-motorized exposure to the food environment, which is when the participants were uh, walking. And here in this study, an, uh, uh, an unsupervised algorithm based on the GPS data was uh, used to distinguish between motorized uh, trips and uh, non-motorized trips. And uh, so this, um, this um, uh, unsupervised algorithm was relatively successful in identifying non-motorized trips, uh, which uh, was uh, confirmed um, in, a, in a manually labeled uh, sample where it, it was indicated whether each trip was supervised, uh, was um, uh, motorized or non-motorized. And so the researchers used this approach to recalculate the, uh, the exposure to food environment, to food outlets during uh, uh, non-motorized uh, trips. Uh, so this is a uh, well, uh, quite advanced use of GPS receiver to, uh, to, to, to determine um, the exposure to food environments. And finally, the third example that I will take just on, on these uh, GPS receivers. In this third study, uh, the GPS receiver was used to measure uh, not the exposure to the environment, but the behavior of interest, which here so is the outcome uh, variable. And for 135 children, uh, it was possible to determine whether they had spent more than 50 minutes in the park over the previous uh, seven days by overlapping the GPS points uh, uh, collected for these, uh, for these uh, children with the location of green spaces in a geographic information system. And uh, additionally, the, uh, the, the researchers uh, calculated with the geographic information system the distance from the uh, residence of the children to the closest uh, park. And then a regression uh, analysis uh, reported here showed that after adjustment, uh, the, the, the use of a park for at least 15 minutes over uh, the previous seven days as calculated with the, the GPS receiver. So this use of park was uh, four times more uh, frequent uh, when the distance from the residence to the park decreased by only uh, 100, uh, 50, uh, 100 uh, meters. So uh, it's a quite accurate study demonstrating that how, well, the, uh, how the closeness of the park will increase the use of, uh, of these uh, resources. Uh, so um, in the literature, uh, we are now uh, progressing toward uh, studies with uh, so-called uh, multi-sensor uh, protocols. And this is what I'm uh, illustrating here. And the idea is that these studies collect uh, simultaneously uh, different uh, channels of uh, timestamp data, uh, time reference data uh, that uh, we can, uh, that they can um, uh, thereafter uh, merge with each other as all the data are ta timestamped. And so here I'm providing examples, sorry, of sensors of location, the GPS receiver, sensors of, of behavior, uh, well, sensors of environmental exposures, for example, air pollutants, noise, light, uh, UV, uh, radio frequencies, and of course, uh, else uh, sensors. And uh, well, in the middle of the slide, I have uh, reported uh, the smartphone and uh, the, the wearable programmable, 
programmable camera. And uh, the idea here uh, is that these uh, two tools can be as, uh, used to assess aspects uh, related to, to the behavior, to the environment, to the health status, which uh, makes uh, them uh, quite uh, transverse uh, tools. That's why I, I reported them uh, in, the, in the middle. Now, what are the trends uh, in this literature? The trends are to use more and more uh, multi-sensor uh, devices, uh, which are tools that uh, comprise uh, several sensors, not only uh, one sensor, uh, to rely on tools that are more and more uh, miniaturized, um, and to rely on, on, on tools with the better uh, autonomy in terms of uh, uh, battery and memory to collect data over uh, longer periods of time. And finally, uh, the, the last trend uh, in, in the literature is to um, uh, make these devices able to connect with uh, computer networks, uh, so uh, to, to, to change them into, uh, into um, uh, connected devices. So now I, I would like to report uh, examples of such multi-sensor uh, studies. And, and as an example, here is the study uh, in which 30 people from uh, Barcelona uh, carried both a GPS receiver and an accelerometer. And as, as is shown on the map, the GPS locations were overlapped with a map of concentration of uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen dioxide. And uh, moreover, by taking into account uh, the physical activity of the participants measured with uh, accelerometers, the researchers uh, calculated the ventilation uh, uh, related to, to the uh, breathing uh, rate of the participants related to their physical activity. And from there, at each GPS point, they calculated the uh, amount of nitrogen dioxide that was inhaled by the participants. And uh, as, as a finding, this study found that uh, trips, travels, travels of participants, responded to 6% of their time, to 11% of their exposure to nat nitrogen dioxide in terms of concentration, and to as much as 44% of their final doses of uh, nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide. And this is a second example on, on uh, again, the exposure to air pollutants. And here in this study, uh, 54 uh, children from uh, Montreal uh, reported their uh, activity in a diary uh, for a period of 30 minutes. And the diary is shown here on the top. Um, and so they had to, to report whether they were at home, uh, in transit, uh, outdoor, or at, at school. And separately, the, the researchers uh, ra ran an automatic classification of the same activities, which is shown on the line below here, uh, which is based on, uh, on two sensors, this automatic classification, uh, GPS uh, receivers, and um, outdoor temperature. And uh, well, it is shown here that uh, the, 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 the activities were captured at a finer scale by the, by the automatic classification at a finer scale than the self-report, which also obviously is due to the fact that the self-report was based on a period of uh, 30 minutes. And in addition, the children carried um, a monitor of a fine, uh, fine particulate matter. And it was found in this study that the exposure to particulate matter during trips was of 15 microgram per meter square with the automatic classification, while it was only of 6.8 microgram per meter square when the researchers used, uh, during trips, when the researchers used the diary of the participants. And so this much lower value with the diary showed that there was a phenomenon of, uh, of uh, misclassification here. So again, uh, the automatic uh, classification was, was more uh, accurate. <clears throat> so now uh, the, the raw data of sensors often uh, do not provide an information that you can immediately use in your epidemiological study. 
And then we need set rules or standard uh, regression models or machine learning approaches to predict the relevant dimensions from uh, sensor data. And here I'm just reporting the sensors that have been used to uh, predict uh, various types of, uh, of uh, information relevant in studies. So for example, to predict the travel behavior of people, studies have used uh, accelerometers, GPS receivers, and heart rate monitors. Uh, to predict uh, uh, energy expenditure, like a very large number of studies have used a combination of a pedometer, accelerometer, uh, altimeter, GPS rece receiver, gyroscope, mag magnetometer, heart rate, electrodermal activity sensor, body temperature. Well, as I said uh, previously, a, a minute ventilation, which is then used to calculate inhaled doses of air pollutants, have um, relied on uh, activity type information, accelerometer, as I said, accelerometer, but also on heart rate monitor or uh, breathing rate. As another example, studies have used sensor to predict uh, sleep duration or uh, and or sleep quality, and uh, well, these studies have used um, um, accelerometers, heart rate monitors, electrodermal activity monitors, and electroencephalography to, to predict this dimension of interest. And you also have a range of studies trying to predict moods and affects. And so they have, have used all the sensors that are reported here that I, I have already enumerated. And well, in addition, um, uh, you know, facial analysis, analysis of the uh, facial parameters to predict, um, to predict the, the, um, to predict mood and uh, affects. Uh, so, um, well, um, our team, uh, we uh, used as an example, um, uh, we, we attempted to predict the transport modes of people in, in, in different studies uh, in four categories, for example, walking, biking, driving, and uh, public transport. And so we, we did that using a random forest, considering a large number of predictors based on uh, the GPS receiver accelerometry um, from a geographic information system and uh, uh, based also on, on survey variables. And we found uh, in our first study that we were able to predict the, the transport mode uh, correctly in 90% of the trips. And since then, we conducted a more accurate work. I'm not going to, to, to go into the detail of this, but we uh, also used, in addition to GPS receiver and accelerometer, in the second study, we use heart rate also to predict uh, the transport mo mode used in study. And we found here that, uh, for example, heart rate did not bring additional information uh, once a GPS uh, uh, variable and accelerometer variables were uh, taken into account uh, in the uh, study. Well, in this uh, other work that we have uh, performed in, in the team, we have used the same record, uh, record GPS study in which uh, we, we collected data on, on, on trips um, uh, with uh, accelerometry and GPS receiver for 229 participants. And in this study, we did not predict, uh, as in the previous one, the mode of transport used by the participants, but we predicted uh, the, the, the level of activity that was conducted, that was performed in, the, in, the, in each of the trip of the participants. And then we, we use this model, predicting the level of physical activity, to predict the level of physical activity in a separate study, in a very large study, the Global Transport Survey, representative of all the in the France region, uh, where uh, 21,000 participants were uh, surveyed. And um, in this large representative database, where we had predicted the level of physical activity, well, we examined what would be the impact um, of the urban travel plan of the Ile-de-France uh, region. Um, uh, if the, this, uh, what would be the impact of the urban, urban travel plan if it was successful on the physical activity of the population? And we tested this by uh, replacing in a probabilistic way 
the transport modes in some of the trips of the of the participants by other modes, other transport modes, in order to increase by 12% the number of trips with uh, public transport and by a uh, 2.5% the number of biking trips, which uh, were the aim of this uh, urban travel plan and of the region. And uh, we, we find that um, in this large sample and rich with physical activity data, the, um, the mean physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity related to transport was of 19 minutes per day. And we found that in case of success, this travel plan, urban travel plan, would increase by uh, physical activity uh, on average by almost two minutes per day. Uh, and another finding was that the increase in physical activity would be slightly larger in a uh, high educated population than in the low educated segment of the population. And so, well, with this study using sensors, um, machine learning and so on, we could uh, raise the warning that uh, urban travel plans like this could increase uh, social inequalities in transport uh, related uh, physical activity. So, with these sensors, um, we often uh, conduct what is called, uh, what we call momentary analysis or live segment analysis. And basically, in our domain, the classical approach on the left will analyze the individuals, the statistical units of the analysis. While in these analyses, we, um, we can investigate the successive segments of observation of individuals uh, with the sensors as the statistical uh, unit of, uh, of the analysis. Um, and well, um, the classical studies will take into account the, uh, the, the environmental exposure at the, at the level of the residence, which is a static exposure. And uh, contrary to this, with sensors, you are able to take into account momentary exposures in the different places uh, visited by the participants. And similarly, uh, with these studies based on sensors, you are able to disaggregate over space and time the outcome variable of interest of the study, which can be a behavior or a mental uh, health status or a physiological uh, measure, uh, for example. And um, what the impact of this is that we are able to to uh, replace the behavior, the outcome variable, in its immediate context. So we have really a close connection between the environmental context and the, the uh, outcome. And uh, well, a final uh, aspect that I, I can mention is that with these studies, uh, you are able to consider uh, individual factors, environmental factors, but also what we call situational factors, which uh, refer to the situation or the circumstances. And this, for example, uh, uh, may be very important in research on alcohol consumption or drug consumption, where, of course, the time of the day, the, um, the day of the week, the type of people uh, around may be very important to predict the behavior of uh, interest. And so clearly, well, these sensor-based studies are short-term effect studies. And they, of course, they are not meant to replace long-term effect studies, but they they complement they complement them uh, uh, quite efficiently, providing another perspective, which is a mechanistic a mechanistic uh, perspective. So, I, as an example, I'm going to take uh, uh, studies that we have uh, conducted in our team based on our Mobilisense project, which uh, was uh, funded by the, uh, the European uh, Research uh, Council. And uh, well, in this study, we were interested uh, in, the, in the, the um, we were interested in the relationship between the personal exposure to black carbon and uh, uh, blood pressure, the, the, the acute blood pressure uh, response. And black 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 carbon is a pollutant resulting, among other, from the incomplete uh, combustion of uh, fossil uh, fuels. And for the analysis, um, I, I want to mention that we are using as much as uh, five uh, different sensors just for this analysis, 
So monitor for the, uh, the, the measurement of black carbon, the exposure. Three sensors for confounding factors, the GPS receiver, the accelerometer, and a, a noise dosimeter. And finally, we are using an ambulatory blood pressure monitor for the outcome uh, variable. And, and so here you see the notion of, of multi-sensor uh, protocol. So ambulatory blood pressure was measured over uh, two days um, uh, with a measurement every 30 minutes. And we are analyzing here 6,700 uh, ambulatory blood pressure measurement for 200 and uh, 45 uh, participants. And so, well, of course, the unit of analysis is not the individuals. The unit of analysis is an ambulatory blood pressure uh, measurement. And the exposure to black carbon was measured in the previous five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and one hour before uh, each ambulatory blood pressure uh, measurement. And here we compare two different statistical models, a multi-level model with a random effect at the individual level takes into account uh, a, a time autocorrelation, and we take into account uh, a fixed effect model that only compares each individual to uh, oneself, to, to yeah, uh, uh, each participant is only uh, compared to herself, uh, himself. And so uh, we, we show also at the bottom of the slide that the models were very uh, carefully uh, adjusted. And we found that a higher exposure to uh, black carbon, yeah, a higher exposure to black carbon was associated with a stronger positive uh, blood pressure uh, response for both systolic and just diastolic blood pressure. And we found that the finding of the, of the random effect model were confirmed by the fixed effect model, so the, the finding old um, uh, um, within participants, we found that the larger the time window, um, the weaker the, uh, the relationship was, and there, that there was no relationship after a like, uh, window of exposure of 30 minutes before the, the blood pressure measurement. So it suggests that the acute blood pressure was uh, very, um, uh, the, 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 the blood pressure response was uh, very acute. And so you have to imagine that these acute blood pressure response uh, will occur like uh, a number of times every day, months after months, years after years, and uh, that it, it, it could, um, uh, for this reason, translate in a, in a chronic effect. Um, and so uh, in the second study, based on the same uh, 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 study, um, uh, our uh, PhD student, Sanjeev Bista, uh, additionally used a sixth sensor, a, a sixth sensor in the study, uh, which uh, is an, uh, another air pollution monitor that measure, uh, you know, um, uh, ambulatory, uh, uh, no, that measure uh, gases and uh, fine particles. And uh, we um, used um, in this study uh, a quantile J computation model to estimate uh, the effect of uh, the mixture um, and um, uh, well, yeah, and the mixture was composed of the different gases and of uh, black carbon. And here, 192 is the increase in millimeters of mercury of the systolic blood pressure associated with an increase in one quartile of each of the air pollutant of the mixture. And we see here in the previous column that this effect of the mixture was um, mostly uh, driven by uh, ozone and uh, uh, black uh, carbon. And again, we found that uh, the, the after, uh, for um, an exposure window of 30 minutes, there was no noticeable effect. And here, we did not find a relationship between the mixture and, um, and uh, the diastolic blood pressure, uh, which is related, as we can see here, in the strong uh, negative effect of uh, uh, carbon monoxide, which is known for its uh, vasodilating uh, effect. And um, yeah, uh, I would like to take another example of what we call um, momentary uh, studies. Uh, and uh, here, uh, this uh, is uh, a study of the food environment in which um, 640, 54 children were uh, surveyed were, and were followed with a GPS receiver. And the outcome variable was um, uh, taken from a diary 
where the children indicated uh, on each day whether they had consumed food to go uh, to school and uh, uh, from on the way back from uh, from school to their uh, residence. And the pass of the participants was evaluated with uh, GPS uh, data. And the exposure that was calculated was the minute that was spent within 50 meters of junk food uh, outlets. And so uh, the, the exposure, like uh, it being close to a, a junk food outlet, and uh, uh, the, the outcome, purchasing uh, junk food, were merged at the treat level. And so the finding uh, indicated that the risk to purchase uh, junk food was uh, higher in uh, trips with a longer ex uh, ex uh, duration of exposure to uh, junk, uh, junk foods. So I, I absolutely want to discuss with you um, the aspect that, okay, these passive sensors uh, allow us to uh, capture uh, various aspects. So we don't have to use questionnaires to uh, ask a question on these aspects. And so it, we have some free space in questionnaires to ask uh, other questions that we are unable to assess with sensors, such as the perceptions of the environment, the affect, the intentions of, of the participants. And here comes this notion of uh, ecological momentary assessment, which is uh, quite uh, important, which is distinct from traditional uh, survey methods. So ecological momentary assessment is a momentary approach to survey participants, where you survey participants with a smartphone on what is happening now, rather than uh, using a retrospective questionnaire uh, uh, much later. And so, ecological because the, the the survey is really in situ uh, on the on the on the place where the behavior is conducted for example rather than out of context like in in classical studies where you survey the participant like uh, at the clinic of uh, yeah and also this uh, notion of ecological momentary assessment is uh, related to the notion of a sampling of uh, experience and so, well, in studies, you are uh, used to sample participants to improve the, the validity of causal inference. And here, it's quite the same. Uh, for example, if you want to survey your participant on, on his uh, stress level, it's, it's a methodological problem. If the participant is able to wait a bit later when he's quiet at home, like uh, no stress, to answer the questionnaires. So as much as possible, you, you want to ask him to answer the questionnaire at a, 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 um, at a time that is decided by the protocol when he received the questionnaire as much as possible. And this is what we call a sampling of experience. So uh, I, I want to mention that in our team, we have developed the Eco Emo Tracker uh, application, which is a smartphone uh, application. Um, and here is how it works in a, in, a, in a simplified way. So there is a web application that allows you to uh, configure uh, surveys. Uh, these surveys uh, are um, uh, managed by a server that uh, sends the, the surveys to the, the smartphone of the participant. And another aspect is that you define questionnaire forms. And these forms are associated with triggers. And these triggers tell uh, when a survey and under which condition a survey should be sent uh, to the phone of a participant. And so our uh, eco emo tracker application, you have screen copies of, uh, of the, the functionalities here, uh, and so permit to, to insert questionnaires in a, in a variety of different ways, like with the checkboxes or radio buttons, by entering a numerical value or a text, by using, as you can see here, a, a slider bar, by entering a, a, an hour and or date, um, and also by recording an audio sequence or even by uh, taking a picture of what you are interested in. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, with this application, questionnaires can be either uh, permanently available or they can be sent at a fixed time or a random time, or they can be sent uh, only when the participant is uh, outdoor, for example, or uh, we have also implemented uh, what we call uh, geofencing, which means that the, um, 
the survey can be sent only when the participant arrives to a specific area or leaves from this uh, area. And I will uh, add that uh, this um, this uh, uh, application collects uh, GPS data in the background of the in the background. Well, so uh, in case you are uh, well interested to 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 use this in your own study, do not uh, hesitate to um, contact me. And so here I want to mention what we call, uh, uh, and I, I think I will uh, finish uh, with this, um, what we call geographic ecological momentary assessment studies. And these are uh, studies that combines uh, GPS receivers with smartphones. And for example, in this study, there were uh, 475 uh, participants, US participants attempting to quit smoking. And so the exposure uh, to tobacco uh, stores uh, was uh, measured uh, within 30 minutes of each of the uh, uh, GPS points, one GPS point every 15 minutes over a month. And the participants indicated in an electronic survey on each day whether they had relapsed, whether they had smoked a cigarette. Um, and uh, it was found that the risk of lapsing, of smoking a cigarette, was increased uh, with uh, the uh, increase with the number of contacts with uh, tobacco uh, tobacco stores on that day. And well, okay, there would be technicalities, important technicalities that we can uh, discuss, but we we can leave this for the for the question. And I, I want to report just an analysis that uh, same type of geographic ecological momentary assessment analysis that we conducted in our team. Um, so in this study, um, uh, 216 participants, elderly participants, uh, filled questionnaires on uh, depression uh, with an adapted version of the CSD depression uh, scale. And we measured uh, environmental exposures over the two hours before each uh, depression questionnaires based on a very large number of GPS points. So for example, on the slide here, uh, you have, uh, you know, these um, uh, very dark blue uh, dots. They refer to places where the participant answered a depression questionnaires. And all the, the other like uh, buffers uh, referring to GPS points refer to the two uh, previous hours. And so we are able to calculate the time that was spent uh, near a blue area, near a green area, or near services and, and shops, for example, over the two previous hours. So it's a, an exposure that is uh, spatially accurate, but also temporally accurate. And um, yeah, just the, the finding of this study uh, briefly, well, again, uh, we, um, so the CSD scale is from, uh, uh, with out, uh, like outcome from zero to three, uh, um, higher score means better mental health. Again, we use two types of analysis, random effect analysis uh, at, with random effects at the day level and individual level, taking into account motor correlation. And we compare this in the second part of the panel with an individual level fixed effect analysis, comparing the individual only to oneself. And so, well, also, I, um, I I want to mention that we calculate the exposure in two different ways um, by, um, by uh, taking into account all the GPS points and only the GPS points that uh, were found when the parties that were collected when the participant was, was outdoor. And uh, briefly, we found that um, uh, uh, spending time near a water, uh, water area uh, uh, near uh, shops and services and near a uh, walkable pass was related to a better mental health after controlling for a large number of factors, including after controlling for mental health, uh, like uh, really uh, um, in the few hours uh, before. And so we found that uh, the relationship, as we expected, was much stronger when we only took into account outdoor GPS points to calculate the exposure. And uh, we found that the fixed effect analysis uh, really uh, agreed with the, with the random effect analysis again. And so we are able with this study to demonstrate environmental factors that uh, have an impact on the uh, daily fluctuations of moods. 
And now I will jump to my uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And uh, provide a few uh, take home message. So what we see is that there is a new generation of environment uh, health studies that is emerging. So this new generation of studies is based on the follow-up of participants with multiple sensors and smartphone surveys, uh, based on the pre-processing of these data with quite complex algorithms. Um, it is based on the calculation of momentary exposures and momentary health outcomes repeated at a quite high frequency in space and time. And also, well, these analyses have to account for the space-time structure of the data. And of course, we have studies of, of short-term effects that are focusing on uh, uh, like really mechanistic processes. So they should be seen as complementary to the other type of longer-term effect uh, studies. And um, well, there are interventional perspectives with these uh, studies. One is that they can contribute to, uh, to, to, to provide urban and environmental re recommendations for urban and environmental interventions, and we can eventually uh, discuss this. And there is also this uh, novel type of uh, um, interventions emerging that are called uh, GTIs, just-in-time adaptive interventions, which are interventions aiming to provide, uh, often based on smartphone right uh, uh, amount uh, of support to the right uh, person um, at the right time in the right place. So that's, uh, that these are implications of these studies. And uh, well, so I, I'm done. And so we have uh, some time left for the questions, if you like.